and academic physics. Welcome to the Simpkins Physics Corner. It's your host, Mr. Simpkins. Hey, for today, you're going to need your notes. It looks like this for graphing practice, page 25. We're going to talk about the qualities of a good graph, some things to look out for, and then how to get some practice with graphing. So let's jump right into it. You guys can follow along starting from page 25. Meta discussion. When somebody shows you a graph, they're trying to communicate information to you. And there are some things, some tricks you can play with graphs to communicate information in a different way that we want to be aware of as we consume scientific information. So as a timely example, uh, climate change is the hot topic here, right? You can see here this graph would show the CO2 concentration and temperature anomaly both increasing at a very alarming rate from 1880 uh, to 2016. It's led people like Bill Nye to say that the planet is on fire. I mean, poor Bill. He's, he's, he's back in the day. He was having a good time. But you know, you can look at that data and you can make a certain uh, conclusion. And then you can zoom out and you can look at the same data: CO2 concentration, atmosphere versus global surface temperature over 400,000 years worth of data, and you might actually see a different picture. So the first thing you want to make sure that you're doing as a scientist and as you're consuming scientific information is to consider what is the scale that they've chose. Uh, why did a person zoom in on a particular portion of that data? And uh, we also want to be aware of com comparing two different things on a different scale. If you're a salesperson and you're trying to communicate how your sales have been going in millions of dollars, which one of those would you show your boss? Well, probably this one, right? But check it out. If you look closely, this is actually the same data. This starts at 30 and goes to 38. It starts at 30 and goes to 38. So there are two of the same sets of data, but on different scales. So just be careful. If somebody's like, look at this change or like, look at this not much change. Make sure you're looking at the scale. And of course, if you don't have a whole lot of data points, you might be making an inference or a judgment that may not carry through for the entire data set. So let's go ahead and see where you guys are at here for your graphing skills. Take a moment right now, take a five minute break, pause this video, go over to Canvas, click this link, and try the IXL practice. And welcome back. How did that go? Did you get a nice smart score? Write down what your smart score was on your packet right there in that little box. Let's keep going with our lesson. So let's talk about the qualities of a good graph. We talked about some things you want to be aware of as you look at graphs. The first thing, and you can follow along with here, feel free to pause the video at any time, is that we're either going to do graphs on a graph paper or on a computer because we want to make sure they're nice and clean. All right. Now, the first thing you want to be aware of is you want to scale your graph appropriately so that it's easy to interpret, that it doesn't change along the axis. Um, you are allowed to use different scales on these axis, but you don't want to clump everything together in your graphing space. So this, this is a nice um, job here because you can see each increment over here uh, carries a certain weight. It looks like every little line looks like this is 20, this is 30, this is 40. So you can see that every few tick marks is worth 10. And over here they labeled in the years and each tick mark is one year. So it's easy to interpret. It doesn't change. It's consistent. Um, and it spreads our data out nicely. The, the other qualities of good graph, of course, we want to make sure we know what we're actually trying to tell people. So here, if I look at this graph, I know it's about bird sightings in a park, and I know it's graphing number of birds versus which park we have. And they even told me, in this case for the bar graph, which type of birds we're talking about. So you notice it has a title. It has access labels or access titles and including measurements or, or, or units. Now, in this case, we don't have units. Um, but if we come back to this graph over here, you see it was in dollars in millions, right? So if there is a unit that you're communicating uh, or a quantity that you're communicating that has units, make sure you include those units. And this is a um, this is a bar graph. But when we look at our data here for the rest of the year, we want to make sure that we're not connecting the dots, but looking for patterns. In physics, we try to establish relationships. And so if I come back over here to this one, I might actually find it appropriate to do a best fit line as opposed to a zigzag curve, depending on what kind of data that we're graphing. All right, so you can hit pause at any time, but so far, if you go back through those last few minutes, you should be able to complete that first section of your notes there. Let's continue to talk about this best fit line idea. All right, the best fit line is what we do to try to capture, if it happens to be a linear function, we try to capture the pattern of what's happening on a graph. Like this is a linear graph right here. So if you, again, feel free to pause the video if you want to write down your notes here. Um, to get this slope of the line, we do a couple of things. First is we circle two data points. And we're going to label them so we know what those data points are. And then we're going to calculate the slope using this formula. M equals, M is the slope, by the way. This is called point slope form, or M equals Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So after you write that in your notes, flip the page, and let's do one with the graph at the top of the next page. On the top of the next page, you'll see this graph here. And we can just pick two points. That was the first thing. I'll move myself over so you can see. First thing we need to do is circle two points. So let's do that. We got this point and this point. Why not? Second thing is label their coordinates. So this one says 0 and 150. So I'm going to label that as 0, 150. 
This one says 3 and 180. So I'm going to label that as 3, 180. Now, uh, this is our first point, number one. This is our second point, number two. This is the y coordinate. This is the x coordinate. This is the y coordinate. This is the x coordinate. So to plug in the point slope formula right here, y2 would be 180. You see where that comes from? y2 is right here, 180. Minus y1. What's the y coordinate of the first point we chose? 150. And we're going to divide that by x2. Here's the x coordinate of the second data point. Minus x1, or 0. And so if we simplify this, we have 130 over 3. And I guess I'm going to need my calculator for that, because I can't do that in my head. It's 40 some odd thing, I think. Let's see. 130 over 3. That's, uh, oh, it's a lot bigger than I thought it was. That's uh, 43.3. Okay. So that's the slope for that graph. I just realized how terrible of a color choice red is. Let me try white. I don't see if we can do that. There we go, 43.3. And the slope always carries a value with it. In this case, it's rise over run. Look at what's on the rise axis, dollars. So it's going to be $43.3 dollars per bike. See over here on this axis, we have numbers of bikes. So I have dollars over bikes, rise over run. The slope unit is 43 3 dollars per bike. So that's just a quick little example of what we mean when we say pick two points, label their coordinates, calculate the slope. Another type of graphical relationship that we might see uh, besides a linear function is a quadratic relationship. All right. So let's go to this one. Quadratic happens when one thing is increasing and the other thing increases a whole lot faster. Um, if you're familiar with an x squared function, like right here, x squared means, you can see here, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but you notice the curviness of this, and you notice how, as the value increases to the right, the, the vertical values increase way faster, okay? This is increasing by y, this is increasing by x squared. So, you know, when you square something, like 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, it gets really big, really fast. That's what's going on, and so all you need to write for this note here is this little equation, and just know that what, what that x squared means. It means that the thing is, one thing is getting uh, bigger way faster than the other one. That's the quadratic relationship. It's a very basic definition of it anyway. And then the other one is an inverse relationship. So we see y, oh sorry, y equals a some coefficient divided by x. That just means that as one thing goes up, the other goes down. Another way to write this would be y equals a over x. So you, if, if I divide by a larger number, if I make that number larger and larger and larger, what happens when you divide by something really large? You get something really small on the other side, right? So this guy would get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as I make x bigger and bigger. And you see that here. So as, as x is only equal to 1, y is 5. But as you increase x, x goes up to 5, and then that y goes down to 1. So as one goes up, the other goes down, and it's going to always look like this kind of curve here. So this is the equation you want to know for that, and that's the shape you want to be identified. So the three main relationships we're going to see this year as we look at physical relationships for things are the linear relationship, like this one, and then we're going to see the quadratic relationship, like this one. And then we're going to see the inverse relationship, like this one. So what are you doing for the rest of class? Well, make sure that you have your physics corral lab uh, sheet all filled out with all of your calculations from yesterday. But you also want, I would like you guys to, um, I would like to come back on Thursday to see your work on pages 27 and 28. It's these two graphing practice ones. What I want to see that you can do is apply all the strategies we just talked about for making a good graph and for doing the point slope formula for these. So let me just get you started here a little bit. Um, this says to graph mass on the y-axis. So I don't have a whole lot. Oh, let's see. It's going to let me write over here. Mass and our mass is in grams here. So I'm going to kind of try to draw over there. And then we have the volume. It says to put the volume on the x-axis. And that's the volume in centimeters cubed. When you choose your axis um, labels, we see that volume goes only up to five. So maybe I can just count like one, two, three, four, five. I mean, I can do like one every five dots or something, like one, two, three, four, five, two, one, two, three, four, five, that's a three, and one, two, three, four, five, that's a four, and one, two, three, four, five, that's a five. Okay, so you see I'm just trying to spread it out. Remember we said we don't want to clump it all in the corner. So there's my volumes, and then my mass has to go all the way up to 100. So I don't know how many blocks are here, but uh, I'm thinking maybe if I make each block worth, I don't know, five Let's see if that would be 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. And there's 50 right there. That's probably a little too tiny. What if I make every block worth 2? I don't know if I'm going to run out of space. 2, 4, 6, 8. There's 10. 2, 4, 6, 8. There's 20. 2, 4, 6, 8. There's 30. I'm going to pause the video. Gee willikers, this was like just barely short. So I've got up to 90. i got to go up to 96.5. So I guess that last one, I'll just kind of hang it up off the graph. Like 5 would be up here like that around like 96 point. 
5. Maybe I'll even just say, hey, that's 96.5. So I want you guys to um, set up your table with, you set up your graph. We should have a nice, um, a nice label as well here, a nice title, I should say. Uh, we could say Gold Nuggets. That's our little title there. And what I want you to show me that you can do is, A, plot the data, but then, B, can you find the slope of the graph? So here for number two, you're going to pick two data points. You can pick this one if you want and this one. And you're going to use that formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's going to be your slope. Once you get that slope, you can actually use that number and the y equals mx plus b equation to calculate any other value that I give you. So when you say what's graphed on the y-axis, it looks like we have mass over there. And when we say what's graphed on the x-axis, it looks like we have volume down there. And it turns out that we can use this as a prediction equation. So if, if the mass is on the y-axis, we could do that. If the um, volume is on the x-axis, we can do that. And if, uh, if our y-intercept is 0, which we can assume it is here, I guess, um, then all we have to do is plug our number for the slope in here. And check it out. You can find mass equals, right? You can find the mass for any volume of gold. So you can plug in volume times my slope equals the mass. And then you have a relationship. And that's what we look for in physics. We try to find natural relationships between two things. So at the end of today, you should have filled out your notes here for pages uh, 25 and 26 for the basics of graphing. You should uh, make sure that you get these two graphs done along with the slope calculations for graphical relationships. And if you still need to wrap up any physics corral activities from yesterday, make sure you do that too. Can't wait to see you guys tomorrow live in the Simpkins Physics corner. Hey, make sure you like, sub, drop a comment, and uh, you never know. You never know what might happen. It might be surprises for the first comment. Just saying. Have a great one.